Humans are considered the only truly conscious animals, because we are not just reacting to our environment, but we do this through a rich and complex inner world. However, I think this complicated, self-aware and highly subjective experience is just one type of intelligent awareness. And in fact, as I will argue here, there are even parallels between our subjective experience and a legacy computer system. The abilities of the human brain such as analytic thinking, self-awareness and subjective experience have long been assumed to be uniquely human traits. Our species does appear to sit at the apex of the pyramid, the top of the evolutionary tree, because we have the most complete, even enlightened awareness in the animal kingdom. However, more recent research suggests that some other animals might be described as conscious because their behaviours and their brain structures suggest a degree of subjective experience. I'm sure most of us will have an idea where we would draw the line between the conscious and the non-conscious animals. Yet the more we learn about animal sentience, the more complicated this picture is becoming. So some thinkers take a more nuanced approach of saying it's not really a binary question of conscious or not conscious. Rather, our subjective consciousness might be considered to be the brightest light of animal awareness, a light which gradually fades into insignificance as we move down to animals with less complex brains. But for a moment consider the nature of the language used here, a phrase like the brightest light of consciousness. Discussions on human consciousness frequently employ words like rich, wondrous, mysterious, vivid and elusive. Now these are all valid terms for the mind movie that we have going on in our heads. However, it's also worth remembering that our inner world is produced by biological hardware, which imposes some significant limitations. Chronostasis, for example. Have you ever looked up at a clock and noticed the second hand apparently freeze before the clock then starts ticking normally? This happens because your brain needs time to focus on and observe the clock before it can decide whether this clock is ticking or has stopped. So the current moment that we experience is not only subjective, it's not even the current moment at all. It's a prediction of what our brain expects the current moment will look like, because all this hunter-gatherer neurological hardware creates a significant time delay between the light entering our eyes and the sensory input being turned into our experience of the now. So this rich, wondrous, vivid inner world that we experience could equally well be described as approximate, flawed, rough and ready. The language that we choose reveals how we feel about our inner lives, and that is something to be aware of because unexamined language can mystify and mythologize, and in this case potentially lead us away from a more full understanding of consciousness. Now for many thinkers, first-person experience is the defining marker of consciousness. Thomas Nagel's 1974 essay, What Is It Like To Be A Bat?, and more recently David Chalmers' Hard Problem of Consciousness, are in a sense a reaction to the materialist idea that consciousness can be solved by more neurological research. Certainly neurology alone is unlikely to explain how complex consciousness spontaneously appears from an otherwise apparently unconscious universe, However, as I argue in another video in this channel, there is a far simpler answer to that question. However, I think the importance of subjective experience gets overstated because it's assumed to be the highest form of awareness in the animal kingdom. So there's a tendency to treat our inner world as some sort of higher truth, greater than the sum of its parts, whereas in fact our inner world is frequently a lesser truth rather than a greater one, as with chronostasis. So I don't want to labour this point by giving lots of examples of flawed human perception. However, from the industry that I work in, computing, I think there is one interesting analogy for the less than perfect nature of our subjective experience. So here's two computers interacting with one another. These days computers frequently do this via an interface that follows an agreed standard a web service or an API, an application programming interface, which allows direct machine-to-machine -machine communication. However, 
Sometimes system A needs to put data into a legacy system and system B is an old timey system that lacks the right interfaces. So rather than reprogramming the legacy system, it's common to use a type of program called a screen scraper. Now screen scrapers read the screen output from the old time system intended for a human. The program navigates through menus, reads text, puts data into input boxes and presses buttons. Compared to systems interacting via an interface, it is of course rather inefficient and error prone. What's happening in a way is that a kind of virtual world, a kind of virtual computer is created in between the two systems so that they can interact. And perhaps this is a metaphor for the subjective and imperfect first person consciousness that goes on in our heads. Rather than our subjective consciousness necessarily being the brightest light of animal awareness, our brains producing a frequently flawed first person experience might be rather like a screen scraper which out of necessity mediates, slows down and limits how we interact with the world. A fascinating example of an animal with a less mediated interaction with its world is slime mould. Slime mould is one of the simplest forms of life imaginable. It has no brain or central nervous system so it's hard to imagine it having anything comparable to our subjective experience. Yet it can perform some complex tasks. It does a better job of navigating mazes than many basic robots. It can also map out transport networks and even anticipate future events. And in another test, given a choice of 11 foodstuffs with a varying balance of carbohydrates and proteins, the slime mold will consistently choose the combination best suited to its physiology, which is something we humans frequently fail to do. Now don't get me wrong, I'm not suggesting that slime mould is more intelligent than humans, or for that matter trivialising the obesity epidemic. And yes, intelligence is about more than just passing tests. But on the other hand, surely one key marker of intelligence is whether an animal will consistently make the most advantageous choice, as the slime mould does with its diet. Not whether an animal goes through a complicated mental process and ends up making a bad choice, as humans often do. Our complex inner lives frequently lead us to do things like eat unhealthy food. But is there not also a tendency for humans to claim that such damaging behaviours are further evidence of our superiority because they result from a complex inner life, instead of recognising that in some ways, simpler forms of life sometimes make better choices? The no-brain slime mould is apparently making an intelligent choice so maybe the basic nature of intelligent awareness is not subjective first-person experience at all. Maybe that is just a byproduct of certain animal brains, rather than the key to the mystery. We know subjective experience is a part of human intelligence, but does that mean it's necessarily a requirement for all intelligence? Now, although we probably are the most intelligent species on the planet, we are still polluting and poisoning a natural world on which we are completely dependent. The human race is thriving and multiplying, but our inventiveness also works against that evolutionary purpose. We are more concerned by abstract concepts, increasing GDP or fighting pointless ideological wars than we are with protecting the only known planet in the universe that can actually sustain our species. In the greatest evolutionary test of all, whether our species can continue to thrive into the future, our complex subjective consciousness may also be detracting from our intelligence and endangering our survival. Now if you found this video interesting, please comment and share on social media, and you may want to take a look at my longer video on scientific panpsychism, the idea that our universe is fundamentally living and aware.